this evening, our scripture lesson will be 1 Chronicles chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 9 and 10, but I will begin reading at uh, verse 1. helps give some context to a very short, short amount of verses. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, I'll begin reading at verse 1. The sons of Judah, Perez, Hezron, Carmi, Hur, and Shobal. Reah, the son of Shobal, fathered Jahath. Jahath fathered Ahumai and Lahad. These were the clans of the Zorathites. These were the sons of Etam, Jezreel, Ishma, and Idbash. And the name of their sister was Hazelel Pani. And Penuel fathered Gedor. And Ezer fathered Husha. These were the sons of Hur, the firstborn of Ephrathah, the father of Bethlehem. Asher, the father of Tekoa, had two wives, Hela and Nara. Nara bore him Ahazum, Hefer, Temanai, and Hahashtari. These were the sons of Nara. The sons of Hela, Zareth, Izhar, and Ithnan. Kaz fathered Anu, Zebiba, and the clans of Harhel, the sons of Haram. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. Jabez called upon the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm so that it might not bring me pain. And God granted what he asked. This is the word of the Lord. Once again, offer a quick word of prayer. Our Lord, we thank you for your word, and we ask now that you would bless not only the reading, but the preaching and the hearing of your holy word. Be with us, Holy Spirit, we ask, in the name of Christ. Amen. If you are a lover of music or any type of entertainment or sports, you would know what it is to see a one-hit wonder. Someone who pops on the scene. Now, unfortunately for music, the first person I think of is Vanilla Ice. It's probably a, a bad example because his music is really that bad, but it's a one-hit wonder. Someone who pops on the scene, you hear about him once, and then he pops off the scene never to be heard of again. Same thing in sports. You hear of a guy who has a great season, and all of a sudden, you never hear about him again. He probably is playing over in a overly, you know, a, a team overseas, and so they pop in, they pop out, they're one-hit wonders. Well, Jabez can be seen as a one-hit wonder. Here we have a gentleman who we really don't hear about in Scripture. He pops up in the middle of a genealogy in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, and we never hear about him again. And yet these two short verses about Jabez, have a lot of impact on us. The first nine chapters of First Chronicles, if you remember, the first nine chapters are all just genealogy, and ever so often we have a quick narrative about one of the members of the family. And here we have Jabez. Now here, just to kind of lay out what we'll be seeing today, three notes you can take or or three ways to head this sermon. So we'll look at Jabez, we'll look at the man of prayer, the prayer of the man, and the God to whom he prays. The man of prayer, the prayer of the man, and the God to whom he prays. So first of all, the man of prayer, Jabez. As we said before, we know nothing about this man, Jabez, and yet, here he is in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, and he pops up. And the only thing we know about this man, the only description we have about him, is that he's considered honorable. That he is more honorable than his brothers. Now, we don't know if his brothers were considered dishonorable. They may have been okay men, but at the very least, we know that Jabez is more honorable than his brothers were. Now, a better translation of honorable may be that he was considered honored. Might not necessarily be speaking of his character, that he was a better person than his brothers or those that were in the family, 
but that for whatever reason, Jabez was in an honored position amongst those in the family and those who were his brothers. So this man, Jabez, the one thing we know about him is that he was considered honored or honorable. The second thing we know about Jabez is that his name means pain. It says that his mother birthed him, and she says, I'm going to name him Pain. She must have borne him in pain. One commentator, I think he rightly says, that here we have maybe a play on words that this man Jabez, he is an honorable man. Now, if you know the word honorable, it has the idea of glory and weight, and yet he was born in pain. Now, I'm not a woman, obviously, but my assumption is the heavier that a baby is, there's a good chance the more pain you go through delivering that baby. So if Jabez was honorable, which means glory or weighty, it could be a play on words that the author is doing here, is that this weighty baby was born in much pain. But it's the story around Jabez, the story around the birth that really describes this man, this man whose birth was about pain. One's name, particularly in Scripture, usually has something to do about the birth or at least the life of that person. Now, my name, well, you see in the bulletin, my name is Jared, but my middle name is Michael. My name, Michael, is one that was born in pain. Now, Michael doesn't mean pain, but the situation that surrounded my birth was painful. About a month before I was born, my Uncle Michael, whom I've never met, uh, my mother's brother, died due to kidney failure. And then one month later, I was born. So to commemorate the death of her brother, she decided she was going to give the middle name to her next son, Michael. And so now, at every family gathering, when they begin talking about their brothers, my mother is one of nine, eight that are remaining because Michael died, when they begin talking about Michael and they ask the question, man, how long it's been since Michael died? Jared, how old are you? Well, I'm, I'm 35. Michael been gone 35 years. What surrounds my name is pain. The family remembers a painful moment when they lost their brother at an early age, and my name commemorates painfulness. Same thing happens to Jabez. His name means pain, and so now whenever his name is brought up in the family, they know, and at least the mother remembers, you bore me much pain. So we know he's honorable. We know that the surroundings of his birth is one of pain. But the one action we know about this man, the way that you can say his honorableness is seen, and honorableness, I'm sure, is not a word, but I made it up because it fit. The one thing we know, the one action we have from this man is that he was a man of prayer. We don't know what his career was. We don't know how many children. We don't, we don't know much about this man, but the one thing we knew about him is he was a man of prayer. The way he was described, the action that was given is that he prayed. Now, I've been to a lot of funerals in my life. I'm sure many of you have been to a lot more. One thing I rarely hear about people in the casket is that they were men of prayer. It's probably a good thing to hear about someone laying there, to know that they are men of prayer, but it's rarely brought up. We'll talk about them being a good father, which is a good thing. We'll talk about them being good workers and providers, which are great things, but how often do we hear, that man sure did pray for people. And yet here, the only thing we know about Jabez, the one action we have about his life, if he did nothing else, we knew at the very least, he prayed. And I would say as we look at Jabez's life, the shortness that we see of his life, the one thing we can take from him is maybe we should be known as a people of prayer. That God's church, not even just in us individually, but us as a people together, we should be known as a people of prayer. It's full of prayer. 
It's interesting that when you look at Mark 11, when Jesus, when he's turning over the tables in anger, he's looking in the temple courts, and what does he say? He says, my father's house is to be a house of prayer for all the nations. People have had turned God's house into a place that was like a market, but what did Jesus say? No, this place is called to be a place of prayer. We should learn from that, that we should be a people of prayer. This place, every church should be a place of prayer. Even as we look at the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul tells the church he wants them to pray for all people. He wants the men lifting up holy hands to pray for kings and authorities in order for the church to live a quiet and godly life. Paul is saying the people should be known as a people of prayer. In this this time, in any season, whether it's a political season or not, there's always friction amongst God's people. There's always friction between the church and the world, and the one thing we should be known for is that we are praying for people. That even as the Apostle Paul calls us, that whether we like the people that are in charge in our cities or in our state and our nation, we should be praying for them. Even as we're pushing them to have better ideas, to, to think better, we should be praying for them. God's church should be a people of prayer. This should be a place of prayer. The writer Ian e. Bounds, he, if you ever read Ian e. Bounds, you know he writes almost distinguishedly about prayer. In his book, wrote, wrote in the 70s, called The Necessity of Prayer, Ian e. Bounds writes, Nothing distinguishes the children of God so clearly and so strongly as prayer. It is the one infallible mark and test of being a Christian. Christian people are prayerful. The worldly-minded are prayerless. Christians call on God. Worldlings ignore God and call not on his name. A man cannot be called a Christian who does not pray. I think Ian Bounds challenges us. If we're going to be known as God's people, the one thing we should be known for to being praying people. So here we laid out the man of prayer. Here's what we know about this man, Jabez. So we have the man of prayer, but secondly, we look at the prayer of the man. Now we look at this, this prayer, the first thing I thought of is what audacity this guy has to pray this kind of prayer to God. Give me more land. Keep me from harsh pain. Give me more stuff. And the first thing I thought of is, what kind of audacity does a man like this have to pray this to God? Unfortunately, I do think that when I'm looking at the text, when I was originally looking at the text, it was colored by the lens of a small book by Bruce Wilkinson called The Prayer of Jabez. Now, to be honest, it had to be written, I'm I'm guessing the late 90s or early 2000s, because I remember my old church using it when I was around in high school. Now, I honestly don't remember the book, so I don't want to talk really bad about Bruce Wilkinson. The book could have been terrible. But I remember how my church and other people used the book. It was horrible. They would use the book and talk about this great prayer, and they would use it for their own selfish and materialistic reasons. They would teach us, pray in a way in which you would ask God, give me more money, give me a better job, make my investments grow. Give me a bigger house. And unfortunately, I'm looking at this prayer and going, what kind of prayer is this in Scripture, this audacity that this man has? But unfortunately, it's colored by the lenses of a bad usage of a book that was written a long time ago. But there is audacity in prayer. There is, to a certain degree, some audacity. We ask the holy God of heaven to hear us, sinful men and women. There's also an earthiness to Jabez's prayer. We can sometimes, as much as my old church and Bruce Wilkinson may have overemphasized the materialistic nature of the prayer, sometimes we may over-spiritualize our prayers. And yet this prayer is a very earthy prayer. He asks, expand my borders and keep me from harm and pain. His prayer is earthy. It's not a bad thing to have an earthy prayer. 
Now, that may not sound good coming from me, but at least Herman Bovink agrees with me. Reformed dogmatic, dogmatics, Herman Bovink says, it has therefore been correctly said that the prayer for a pure heart is as supernaturalistic as the prayer for a healthy body. Think about the Lord's Prayer. At the same time, we say, Lord, give us our daily bread and forgive us our sins. The Lord doesn't say one is greater than the other. He says pray for them both. We need the forgiveness of our sins, but we also need the Lord to provide us our daily bread and all of our goods. On a negative side, we can look at the Apostle James, the brother of our Lord, and what does he say? He said, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and can, cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You do ask and you do not receive because when you ask wrongly, you spend it on your passions. Even the Apostle James is saying to the church, you guys are fighting amongst each other because you need stuff. You're coveting one another's stuff. And he says, listen, just ask the Lord for what you need. Bess's prayer is an earthy prayer, but we are called to earthy prayers. The reality is we cannot live physically without the Lord's help. And so we should go to him for our daily help. It's an earthy prayer. We're called to pray earthy prayers, but... At the same time, this prayer, it's not a selfish prayer. It may seem like it's selfish as Jabez is praying for, it seems like his own personal land or his own personal property, but the reality is pray, Jabez's prayer is larger than himself. We have a clue in verse 10, he says that he prays to the God of Israel. Jabez, he serves almost as a microcosm for all of Israel. As Jabez is honorable, glory, and weighty, and also as he as is a man that has been marked, at least his birth by pain, the people of Israel. The nation that has been chosen by God, you can say, called to be honorable, full of glory, as they are God's people, are also a people that are full of pain. In the context of First Chronicles, they are post-exile which means that they are back in the land, but they only occupy a small portion of the land they originally had. The temple at that time had not been rebuilt. Their place of worship was gone, and they had no king that was in the line of David on the throne. They're still ruled by outside people. And so Jabez's prayer serves as a microcosm of the people of Israel and what they're looking for. They need their borders expanded. They didn't have all their land back. They want to experience all of God's covenant blessings that they were promised. They want God's hand of protection on them. They want to live without pain. His prayer may seem selfish, but when Jabez was, was praying, he was praying almost on behalf of the people of Israel as whole. They needed God's blessings. They needed God's protection they needed their land to be expanded to what God had originally promised them the reality is his prayer and this man Jabez he serves not only as an example in a microcosm of Israel but he serves as an example for all of humanity all of us live in between pain and glory the idea of pain, it alludes to Genesis chapter 3, which all the children of Eve, which includes all of us, are born in pain. Your personal birth story may not be full of pain, but the reality of this life in this fallen world is indeed full of pain. Whether it's the surrounding circumstances in life or the sin that dwells within our own hearts, a life is full of pain, and yet we are people who are honored. We have been created in God's image. We're in an honored position in the creation. The psalmist would say, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him, yet you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, crowned him with glory and honor given him dominion over the works of your hands, you put all things under his feet, 
we as God's creation, creatures created in his image, are in between honor and pain. Created in God's image, but full of sin and a life that sometimes is just full of pain. And our prayers, no matter how specific, fall into four main or three main categories. We are always asking, Lord, deliver us from the pain of the fall. Lord, grant us your covenant blessing. Lord, may our life not be marked by pain. Whether the pain that comes against us or the pain that sometimes we unfortunately give to other people. We don't know much about this man. But we know that he was in the middle of pain and honor. And he serves as an, ex- as an example for each one of us who live in the middle of pain and honor. And as he prayed and asked the Lord for God's blessings on him and his people, our prayers are just the same. Bless us, Lord, with your covenant blessings and keep us from the pain of the fall that harms us. So we have the man of prayer. We've looked at the prayer of the man. And lastly, here comes good news is the God to whom he prayed. The end of the verses at verse 10. We have the best news we can hear from these verses and God granted what he asked. God granted what the man asked. God hears. God cares. And God will respond. Each time we pray whether we go feebly on our knees because we're not sure that God hears us, or even when we go boldly to the throne of grace, remember God hears, God cares, and God will indeed respond. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we have this promise, a verse that is very famous that a lot of people know. You'll remember it. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, Seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. That's a word of promise to God's people. He hears, he cares, and he most certainly will respond. As we look at 1 Chronicles chapter 4, and when we set it in the larger context of First and Second Chronicles, if you remember the hope, of these two books is that God would one day again place one who is in the line of David on the throne. When we pray, we know that God has responded, for indeed God has set one in the line of David on the throne forever and ever. God has in Christ, whether in the context of First or Second Corinthians, Uh, Chronicles or in our life has set Christ on the throne. We know God hears our prayers before because God has given us Jesus Christ. The greatest gift that God could give was his own son on our behalf. Even when it seems like God doesn't hear our prayers. When it seems like he's not responding as quickly as we would like. Or even when he responds, but doesn't respond how we like. At the very least, we know we can be assured that God has heard us and he's given us the greatest answer. Because he's given us Christ, his only son on our behalf. Life. on This side of glory will still unfortunately be filled with pain, but we know we have God's good answer to us. Christ, the man said, the son of David, he sits upon the heavenly throne forever. He's God's gift to us. We know indeed God cares for us, that he hears us, 
and that in Christ he most certainly has responded to us. Let us pray together as the Lord knows, as we know the Lord indeed hears us. We thank you, Lord, as we have looked at your word and seen how you have responded to Jabez and his prayer. We know that you indeed hear us. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us your greatest gift and the greatest response to any need, which is Jesus Christ, your son. Help us in the most difficult days, in the most difficult times, to look to him and to him alone. We praise you, our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.